S&P 500 holds a critical level. NASDAQ is green after three red weeks. The dollar closes over 106 for the first time all year. Tesla is setting up for a move. Certain kinds of energy companies are absolutely imploding. We'll explain why. S&P high beta is giving a clear signal. We'll explain what it is and what to look for. Why Japan CPI print was the most important economic data of the week. NVIDIA has its first green week of the month. We have a ton to get through. Let's get to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back we have a lot to go over so we're gonna jump into it if we look at the es on the week we came to our neckline let's pop that in so we can take a look at it and it's pretty clear pretty daunting but it's pretty clear what happened so you can see before the head and shoulders held up and you can see that obviously here with the left shoulder head right shoulder here's the neckline the break the rally through and then the subsequent break the retest here and then you can see how we broke through our test here and once again test it I'm hearing that this is a head and shoulders it's quite possible but we also have to take a look at what else is shaping up here where we have an inverted head and shoulders and we're back on that neckline so if you want to play devil's advocate here you could say left shoulder head left shoulder head right shoulder neckline breaks out of neckline tests rallies fails tests again so far it's holding there is an argument to be made for that so this is something that we have to look at during the saturday videos we like to do this where we can take a little extended time frame and look at what's going on to me this is pretty glaring and i think today's activity was fairly glaring as well now if we just look at some basic indicators you can see here with the ichimoku cloud that we are far above it it is still widening and we have a ways to go before this turns anywhere near bearish anything like that and obviously this is a leading indicator because how it's calculated i've done a video on this indicator before not going to get into it all now but you can see how we were down and how this is starting to curl back up and everything's fairly positive here but there are some other indicators that are not as positive and we should review those now, what's nice about this is we get those end of the month charts as well but you can see obviously here you can see the cross here i mean this should not make you feel warm and fuzzy about the s p you have the macd cross and that's not ideal last time we started to have something like that was around the same level you are right here now and that's definitely not something you want to mimic I and mean, if you take the high of that line and just come straight across you can see this is where we ran into problems before when we started to roll and we definitely don't want to have something similar happen so we have to keep our eye on this because it's not ideal now, if you look at the rsi you can see very clearly how we've already broken there in this area and that's not something we really want to play with you have the lower low already in place and you're making the lower low here as well so you're coming right in and as soon as you crack this level and you break that 70 it's usually a pretty clear sell signal and you want to make sure you hold 50 we don't want to start breaking 50 now the larger issue here is this so you have a trend line from here that you've been holding and we're all seeing that we're holding that trend line if you take this data point to this data point you come across according to rsi you've already broken from this level rsi is usually a leading indicator so when you start seeing this kind of movement rsi does tend to lead there we're going to have to see how it plays out do we hold this level right here at 50 or not if we see weakness then we're going to have to go from there candidly there's some pretty glaring ways that we're we'll able to tell I'll get to those in a moment now this is rate of change and you can see that we have broken that zero line that is not where we want to be at all and not only have we broken that zero line we've made the lower low you can see the lower low here as well anytime you are below that zero line anytime at all if we take a look at this you, it gets pretty obvious how this plays out so if you take a look from when we broke here and you just come across in that area you can see how you completely underperformed ever since you broke down and if we take a moment just go come over to another area right here and just look at this a little clearer you can see from that break how we performed it's not ideal when you get below that zero line so you really don't want that to happen we obviously will not look at the pandemic because that's obvious but if we come to 1819 and you look at the same thing you start breaking this it doesn't get pretty it gets pretty ugly and rate of change is pretty self-explanatory we've gone through it a couple times this is what we're dealing with now so is that enough you know, if you look at this if it starts getting worse it's probably not enough it's probably telling you you're going lower if we undercut and then rally back through i'd feel a lot better so we're looking for some kind of rally i'm not really sure what's going to do that besides getting out of this time of year and getting into a better seasonality and maybe the government not shutting down I know that is definitely an overhang we saw that at the end of the day today but if we just kind of click through these again and we look at the same thing on the nasdaq before we get into the exact levels i would watch if you see how this plays out right there there we go this little section in comparison to this we're making these lower lows and we did make a lower low here 
Now, we don't want to see that. You don't want to be coming across having a, basically a straight line, and then at the same time, you have this pointing down. That's not what we want, so that's something we want to pay attention to. If we look at the same exact situation here and say, okay, well, what happened in this area? Well, that's, and let's just come all the way over to when it actually breaks. You know, that's not ideal. Right? You have underperformance. Nobody wants underperformance, and you know, I certainly don't, but you can see that. You come down. Thankfully, you were closer to the line than you are here. But you just don't want that. And I really think that that's something that we're kind of setting up for here. I don't know that we're done. I think if we were done the sell-off, we might have rallied today a little bit stronger. Today being Friday at the time of recording this. The problem with that statement is that you have the government. And I don't know that a lot of people understand fully that a government shutdown means we don't get economic data. Now, this happens from time to time. We get one big trade. And you can see in here how that's going. We do have something that happened in the market that's pretty interesting that was actually the reason that we put the top in. And we're going to address that later in this video. It has to do with what happened with Japan and uh, happened actually this uh, yesterday. But we found out about it today. So we will get into that. But you can see this. I mean, that's not going to make you feel really good about what's going on there. That little crack. You look at the last time that happened, you can see that area right here. That's not ideal. You, know, you want to be going up at a minimum. You want to be going sideways. If you can go sideways, that's ideal. As long as you're building something, we're not doing that. We're actually rolling right here and that's leading to this. And we actually, if you take a look from this line over, this is actually lower than this, which means that we now have a negative divergence there on the weekly as well. So none of this is ideal. If we could start backfilling it, that would be great. We're going to look at some things that might point to that, that we're oversold. But I'm wondering if we're more oversold than we're out of the woods. Now, this is pertinent. You know, back here in June and uh, that was October, you can see this here. Let's draw it this, let's draw it this way. You can see that divergence. Right? And I talked about this back in the day. If you were watching these videos back then and just discussing how this was obviously a positive divergence, which could lead to a bottom, you never know if it's going to. It did. And it was a rough one, frankly. But then we got over here and everyone got a little frothy and you can see how we've worked that off. And when you start getting to these levels, they're pretty insane levels. So you're going to work it off. What I don't like, again, is I have this negative divergence. I'm not really crazy about that. But you have the same setup here where you're trying to hold this line. And candidly, I don't know that you're going to hold it. This one's actually a lot lower. If you really look at this left shoulder, head, right shoulder, if you were going to come across, you're really up here somewhere for a line. You're nowhere near where you are in the S&P. So if this was going to test that quote, you know, left shoulder, head, right shoulder, neckline, if we were going to do that, we're nowhere near it. So something else for us to take a look at. Now, here we are in the weekly and you can see where the cloud is on the weekly. So the long term trend is above the cloud. Uh, I like to see this, but let's start drilling into the details just a little bit. So here we are in the NQ and I just want to point something out that's pretty glaring to me. And you can see in here that we broke here, stayed under the cloud under the cloud. And again, this counts out 26 days for those that aren't aware of this indicator, but usually count. it should be like 26 days by the time they are over here. But you're about 26 days out. It's not about you're 26 days out. That's how they count it. So this tells you the future, whether you're going to be up or below it. If you have an uptrend and you're going sideways, that's better than having a downtrend, but you are below the cloud. And this is very simple to understand. I mean, I can make this glaringly easy. If you are below the cloud, like you are here, one of the things that this system will tell you in that little box right there is that you will have underperformance. So the idea that you're out of the woods or you're going to put on some swing trades and just hold on to them here, it's probably not an ideal place to think that that's going to happen. Now, there's a couple other things that are happening with this. It's getting wider. We don't want that. And again, this is more of a day to day where we were just looking at a much longer term ideal on what's going on. And you can see very clearly here. I mean, this thing will tell you exactly what's going on. It's if once you know how to use it, it's uncanny how, how good it is. But you can see right when you flipped and that was 26 days out and right here, that was pretty much the high tries to get back over the cloud, but the clouds in a downtrend can't hold up over tries again. Nope. And then finally, what happens? The cloud starts to turn, go higher, comes back, retest the cloud. And then that was it. So what you have here is you actually have a change in the cloud. And what I mean by that is we're declining. And at the same time, we're declining. The cloud's getting wider. I need to pay attention to this as much as I like the fact that we didn't you know, fall down today. You saw weakness and you, we can't blame it on the government shutdown. But we do need to be aware of that. And with all the data that came out coming in line, and this is the best that we can do, there's something to be said about that. And maybe it's possible that we're going to have to wait for November. Maybe October is going to be sideways and then November will be good. We really have no way of knowing. And you, we're going to have to, just have to see how this plays out. Now, with that said, also something else that I think we have to look at is look at some of this stuff as the NASDAQ on a more shorter term basis. How so? 
Well, number one, if you come here and let's get rid of the 22, the 12, and the 55. I use a 22, a 12, and a 55. You should use what you're comfortable with. Let's get to that arrow. So if you have the arrow here and you see that 55, you can see how that is pointing down. That is the exact opposite of what you wanna say. It's not what you wanna see at all. So we have a declining 55, which we know about. We've tried to rally over it and we failed. And when we broke, this is what we got. Now, there are some signs here that we should also pay attention to. For example, I could make the lower low today and you can kind of see where you're at here. That is a positive divergence. Now, what could that get us? Yeah, maybe that could get us a, a retest up here, 15, you know, 15, five. That's possible to get something like that. It doesn't mean that you're going back to these levels, but it does mean that there's some kind of bounce out there if we drilled into it for time's sake. We'll do that in the daily videos during the week because we have a lot to cover today. But that is possible. And then you just start moving down the line. Look at the 22. So I have a 1222 cross here. It never came over that. And the way that I always like to use these, and I'll just point them out, and you should use your moving averages how you see fit. But I, I actually assign them so they make sense to me. So in other words, every time I'm below the 55, I have lost institutional sponsorship. That's how I view the 55. That's how I was just trained. But if I look at that, I, it's not something I want to be involved with. If you look at how we hit the 55, it's pretty glaring what happens when you hit there and how we respect it. And again, I use the 55. If you use the 50, that's great. So you can see those levels there. You can see what's happening. So that's how I use the 55. I got asked how I use these, so I'm walking through it. I read all your comments, and I appreciate you sharing these, retweeting them. It helps greatly with the algorithm, and it helps me from having to literally run ads in the middle of these, which save you a bunch of time, and I know that you don't want that. So please comment if you think these videos could be better or how we could make them better, and please share this, especially now. This is an extremely confusing time. 22, how do we use that? That is my demarcation line. Are the bulls in charge or the bears in charge? Okay, if I'm above it, then the bulls are in charge, like here. If I'm below it, the bears are in charge. We also have to deal with slope. Do we have an upslope? That is bullish. A downslope, that is bearish. But I want to know if I'm up and over. And then, of course, the slope can matter more. But in this case, we can see what's happening. We're making lower lows on the slope. If you actually just looked at it from that perspective, it's pretty glaring. Now, the 12, the 12 is how I look at the world and say, okay, do I, would I swing trade this? Would I want to be in a longer term swing trade of this? And if I did, what side of that longer term swing trade would I want to be on? If I'm here below it and it's pointing down, I do not want to be on a long term swing trade here. A matter of fact, the way that I use this 12 is really simple. On rallies, you want to short. That's it's if, if I'm not, if I'm rallying and I'm over it and I'm pointing up, I want to be long. It's not, don't overthink it. I mean, it's really that simple where you could see from this whole period of time, all you were doing was going long here. You have to kind of change your thinking. You have to be a little quicker. One of the things, if you look at the comments, people keep saying to me, oh, well, you're changing your, your mind. Yes, that's what you do when you're a trader. You change your mind. Your job is to make money. Your job is not to come up with a thesis and then try to convince people that you're, I can't think of anything quicker way to lose money than just say, oh no, we're definitely going higher or no, we're definitely going lower and ignore the data. Your job is to analyze, not predict. Huge difference. And I would strongly suggest you re-listen to what I just said there. But if you look, look at this, you would have to use the 12 and say, okay, on rallies, we did that today. On rallies, we sold stocks and we did quite well with that strategy. Off the open, we were looking for some kind of turn. You can use smaller moving averages if you like. Like for example, I'll use a three, a five, and an eight on a 15 minute chart to see what's going on there and to see if I can get some more short-term reading signals for maybe a trade that lasts for a day or two. Some people will call that a swing trade. I just call it carrying a day trade over. Essentially, that's really all you're doing, but I'm not gonna split hairs about what, who's going to call what what. But I find these extremely helpful. And it's just a three, a five, and an eight, and I color code them so that I could see. That said, you should do what you find most helpful. For me, looking at them, it tells me a story. I, if I use them that way, that story is extremely telling, especially now. You could look at this and just very quickly go through your list of names and say, which ones would I swing trade today, which ones wouldn't? Who, who are the bulls and bears in charge of this market? Is it institutional sponsorship? Anything that you can do to streamline your process helps you. Do I have institutional sponsorship here? Do I have institutional sponsorship in ES? See how easy it is to get that read, see that neckline? We should drill into the ES and just use that as our guide. We can see the levels right here and how we're holding and just get a sense of the ES in and of itself and what's going on here. I mean, I, I see the head and shoulders, guys. I mean, we talk about it all the time. I half joke about it, but I see it. But the bottom line is exactly what I stated about two weeks ago. I don't really care. I didn't care when everyone was saying it was a right shoulder here. I didn't care when they were saying it here. By this time, we're shorting. And here, if you're shorting that break, I'm covering into you. You're my exit liquidity. And then you're bouncing off of that. And now you're retesting. And now if you're 
tied to a position that this is a head and shoulders, you didn't break, and now you're making lo higher lows, you have a problem because you're making an assumption that you're definitely going to break. And we don't know that. I don't know what happens if there is not a government shutdown, if things get better. And you have a, you have a shift that happened in the market. And it's one of the reasons why we saw what we saw today with Japan, and we're going to get into that. But if we overlook this, this is pretty clear that we didn't break down. Let's just do a 15 real quick. I don't like going this small during the week videos, but I think that this is really glaring. If you just look at the past two weeks, look what they're doing. Look at how, or two days rather, I apologize. Look at what they're doing. You're not going anywhere. And if you think you're breaking down, you're doing the exact opposite. A matter of fact, for, for, the, for the head and shoulder gang, I mean, you probably see it where you have that left shoulder, head, head here, right shoulder, the break, the retest, higher high, retest again. So do you think that this is an important level? 40, you know, 43.24, 43.25, you probably want to watch that. If you're a short-term trader, you're certainly going to want to watch the 43.11. There was a whole battle royale going on at that 43.05. 4,300 level, we know that that's a key level. And then of course you don't want to take out the head. So there, there's some stuff in here that you're going to want to watch. And this is your battleground around that whole area. So you're going to want to watch that. Now, the other thing that we should address, if we look at the, you're going higher. And even though you went higher on the week, yes, the market sold off, but you sold off today. And I think that's a really important distinction. Uh, if we just kind of look at that, well, why did that happen? We're going to get into it. But if you take a look at the VIX, the VIX sold down and then rallied into the close. Not surprising with a government shutdown because you just don't know what's going to happen. And I don't think that the, I don't really think that the market's prepared for it. I don't think it fully grasped that if you have a market shutdown, what happens is you don't get economic data. If you don't get economic data, how, how are they going to, how are you going to trade? How are you going to trade the dollar with no economic data? You're going to be guessing at things and it could go on for weeks. It's a real, it's a real issue and it's something that needs to be addressed and hopefully they come to conclusions, but Goldman has it at a 90% chance of a, a government shutdown. So it is what it is. If you look at the dollar on a daily, you can see that we came down, we're holding this neckline. But from my perspective, if, if you're a trader and you're looking at this, let's drop these in and you know, we can go through the same demarcation I just went through. You have institutional sponsorship. The bulls are in charge. There's your 22. If you were looking to swing trade, it doesn't get any more obvious. These are getting wider and they're spreading up. You look at the 200 and this was the other demarcation line I went over where, you know, I, I really rarely take a long term stance against something. If I have a death cross, I don't really want to take the other side of that and say, I'm going to go long. Just like here on the dollar, I don't want to go short anymore. And the other thing that should be troubling is that now we're holding that support level on the dollar and let's do this on a weekly. And let's drop it to here and then do it on a weekly because we don't need the lines now. But one of the one of the key issues is that if you look at this, if you overlaid the S&P with this, well, the S&P rallied until the dollar dropped or we rallied and then we had up here and that was the peak. And I think that's an important distinction on what happened. Once we peaked on the dollar, that was pretty much it. Okay, that was the bottom. And then we sold off. And then what happened? We rallied, tried to rally, tried to rally. And since we've been ripping, and that from that and actually it was from July 27th, the Japan news. And then that was it. It was on. And if you take a look at that on a week or just on a weekly basis, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 weeks, 11 straight weeks of the dollar going up. It's pretty unprecedented when you look at this chart over any period of time to see anything like that. I and mean, if we just go back a decade, you, maybe you have a situ you have a situation right here where you did that. But other than that, we don't have anything like that. And I think that's important. And we should probably talk before we go forward about what actually happened. So there was a major shift today and no one's really picking it up. And I think we should go over it so that you understand what's really driving the macro behind everything thing is you're well aware that I, I look at the world uh, through a lens of the stool and I'll drop the stool in for everybody. But really the way that I look at the world is this. Uh, I look at a macro picture. We look at a fundamental picture and a technical picture. You know, the macro is really what's driving the beast right now. As I like to say, we're in a situation. It always depends on like which leg we're actually leaning on. But the way that I look at it right now, we're in one big trade and that's the dollar. That's the treasury bond market. And that's all linked globally. So it's really important for us to understand that and then drill into it and figure out what we're going to do about it. So right now we're dealing with a macro issue and this actually put the high in on the market, whether or not you understand that, but we're about to go through it. So what's important is just where to start. We're going to start with Japan and what Japan did. They changed their outlook. Bank of Japan, New York Times 
Bank of Japan in a surprise signals a move away from easy money. Japan's central bank looks to step towards allowing interest rates to rise, saying it'll be more flexible in managing its bond market. Now, it's important for us just to take a look at when this came out. And you should be able to see that date right there, July 28th. This was written the next day from this guy in Tokyo in the New York Times office. So why is this important? Well, let's just talk about the key issues here. No country in the world holds as much debt as Japan, which has one trillion in U.S. government treasuries alone. Even the slightest shift in Japan's low interest rates reverberates well beyond its borders with the potential to drive up rates globally. So what has happened since July 28th? We're going to go through some charts so that you can see what's happened since July 28th and what's transpired today, what they were expecting to happen, and what is actually happening after data was released. A surprise move was the latest signal that the country may revise its long-standing commitment to cheap money and to spur sluggish economy growth. Rising interest rates abroad have driven up inflation and weakened the yen. An announcement after a two-day policy meeting, the bank said it would take a more flexible approach to controlling yields in the 10-year government bond, affecting allowing them to slip above the current ceiling of 0.5%. This is the best bond trade in the world. What people are doing is they are selling these bonds and they are buying treasuries, U.S. treasuries on margin. So let's say you're doing four to one, you're paying out 2% and you're getting 16% and you're booking the difference. Now you have to have leverage, margin. There's all kinds of compl complications associated with it. I'm making the trade very simple, but that's the trade. But if you raise yield on bonds, if the yield goes up, bond price drops. If bond price drops, then your margin requirements are going to go up. If your margin requirements go up, you have to deleverage your bond portfolio. Just like if you're in a stock and the stock comes down, you may get what's called a margin call. Well, that can happen in bonds, and it does happen in bonds, and it's on steroids in comparison to what happens in the stock market. So we will take a look at some movement here on some indexes and sectors in a while, as well as what happened with the US dollar and what happened with the yen. But this is from the Japanese uh, Japan Times, apologies, and this is September 13th when this came out. The other article was July 28th. Bank of Japan watchers moved forward with their forecast for an end to negative interest rates. All 46 economists surveyed by Bloomberg over the past week said BOJ will stand pat at next week's board meeting with half expecting authorities to abandon the sub-zero rate by the end of June. Last month, 31 predicted a rate hike within that time frame. Some 9% respondents in the latest survey see the BOJ adjusting or discarding its yield curve mechanism in October. Most economists say regardless of timing, the next change for YCC will be scrapping after the bank's essential widening on around 1% in July. There's a chance of an early policy shift. Okay, so we went from they haven't done anything for decades to there's a chance of an early policy shift. Every policy meeting has become live. Now, this is kind of interesting. The change in rate expectations comes with core inflation still above the target after 16 months and the yen not far from a three-decade low, raising the prospects of further prices rising fueled by elevated imported costs. Okay, this was September 13th. Now, for time's sake, I'm just going to take this directly from Reuters, September 27th. Bank of Japan July debate highlights rift in view on rate hike timing. Note the change two weeks later in these headings. Now, this is where it gets interesting. We've gone from they're changing their stance at the end of July to now, September 13th. It was very clear that they could even move sooner to September 27th. We have board divided on whether firms would keep hiking wages. So the board's deciding, well, our firm's going to be able to keep raising wages. If not, well, that's going to be an issue. One saw risk of Japan seeing U.S. European style inflation. Another warned of rage growth could lose momentum. Divergence underscores uncertainty on rate hike timing. BOJ makes tweaks in YCC in July to make the ease policy sustainable. So these are some of the issues that they are currently dealing with. Why the change in tune? Well, this is where it gets interesting. So this came out last night. At the time of recording this, this is Friday, so we're referring to Thursday evening. And you can see CPI, Tokyo, X, food, and energy. Energy. Well, they're talking about this rising to a level. Matter of fact, in the article, they talked about it rising to a level of 3.1%. Well, we're certainly not there on some of these numbers. You can see the 2.8% here right now. X food and energy 2.4. The previous was 2.6. 
Java applications are standing pat. And really what I'm interested in is the CPI because this is what's changed. Core CPI, 2.5 versus 2.6, 0.8, it's actually dropping. Their core CPI is actually dropping. Well, if that's the case, then they're not gonna to need to raise rates. If they don't need to raise rates, that's gonna stabilize a lot of other currencies. It's gonna stabilize a lot of bonds. That's why we went through those articles. You might want to go through that again if you're not following along. I know this is pretty in-depth. Comment below if it's too in-depth, but this is why the dollar sold off. This is why bonds rallied. And if you don't understand this, then you don't really know why equities were bidding up this morning and you might think it's some, something else. And it's really important to get this because there's a lot of you know people suggesting that things are happening for a different reason and correlation is not causation. And it's really important to get that. It's really important to understand why things are happening. Because if you can connect the dots and put all the pieces of the puzzle together, you know, the macro, the fundamental, and the technical, you're ahead of 90% of the people out there that, that you're competing against. And you are competing. So CPI Tokyo X food and energy month over month is negative. Right? So these are not numbers. If, if the US had these numbers, they'd be doing cartwheels right now, candidly. This is why we saw what we saw. Now, a couple of things to remember. DXY, 14%, 13.6 to be exact of DXY is the Japanese yen. If you want to get super specific and we get into the exact date where they made the statement, what date do you think that was? That wick right there. So if we know the day that they said that they were going to do this is right here. And we know that that put a low in on the market. Sure, we bounced a little bit, but this is from what was going on with the yen. There's no question about it. Now, you look here and you look at this date right here, and if you haven't seen this before, I think you just will find it. I find it extremely interesting and very important. And I'll just come right across to July 26th as well, and look at that bar right there. So look at what happened to the yield that day right here. And you can see how that played out as well. You never looked back. What else didn't look back? The dollar didn't look back. Now this is you know, really, I mean, it's pretty interesting to me, I guess, but look at this date and look at the high of the ES. The futures market right there is the high. Now everyone's gonna say it's because of NVIDIA, it's because of this and the tech's too high and we've gone too high too fast. And No, it's because Japan, which has a trillion of US treasuries alone and the amount of money that is borrowing and literally selling the, the Japanese bond market, they're selling that treasury and buying the US treasury at something like four to one or eight to one leverage. And when that unwinds, it's gonna be nasty. You wanna talk about a true credit event? If something like that happens, there could be issues to that. And that goes back to, I'm gonna bring it out again for everyone to see, that's why there's a stool. And that's why you have to understand this because causation, you wanna know why things are happening. You might think, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm a technical analyst. You will get picked off all day long by people. People that are gonna take that over and make it an all time high, you're gonna buy into it and not understand that all they're doing is just using you for exit liquidity. That's that's all they're doing. Okay, macro, fundamental, technical. The more you know, the better position that you can be. And that's really what you need to understand. A lot of people will just say, oh, I just need to look at the technicals. The technicals today, if you're looking at the technicals, that's not why we moved. If you understand those pieces that we just went over, you're ahead of the game. Now, if you look at a couple key factors here, that data was released on the 28th. All that happened on the 28th, now the bond market or the dollar did rally, but since that data was released, all we did was go low. And we've never been higher on the dollar. And I think that's an important distinction. Is that CPI number, is that statement by them going to mark the bottom? Is that macro event going to mark the bottom? The same way that a macro event marked the bottom of the ES back here. And you will remember that, hopefully you'll remember that. This is where we had CPI and CPI peaked. Okay, that was a macro event and that was not a technical reason to bounce. And those that understand that the Fed peaked then had a, or that CPI peaked, had a huge advantage over those that have no clue. And they're just looking at a technical chart saying, oh, we're gonna break that, you know, whatever we're gonna call it pattern. And this time we're really gonna break. And I think that's an important distinction. You have a, you have a group of people out there that are still saying that we're gonna take out these lows. And quite frankly, they're delusional. Unless you get some massive, massive event, massive event that you're not gonna see this again. You may trickle down to this at some point in our lives, but there's nothing out there that's gonna get us back to that level of inflation anytime soon. It's just, it's just not feasible. So if we understand that and we understand why this happened and we understand why we peaked here, and we understand that these are macro events that put in the bottom of the market 
and the top of the market, do you think that maybe we want to pay attention to geopolitical events, global events, economic events, macro events that actually shape the world? It might not be a bad idea to have your handle in that just a little bit. Now, if we look at the Japanese stock market and you can see the levels in here and just Here's where they made that announcement. And you can see when the date they made that announcement, how the market ripped. I think this is pretty telling. I think the market already knows that that's pretty much it. And here's why. We rip on the market. And then you can see we try to hold there, come back down. We try to clear that level again on where that announcement is. That's why knowing these dates and why these things happen on those dates, it's so telling. And you can see how we're acting right in here right now. And I think that's a very important distinction. This also goes to this. You look in here and you look when Toyota wound up hitting a high and then we think Toyota should go higher because of the strike and all of a sudden what's happening Toyota's dropping and we don't know why and then we go look at that economic data and maybe their economy is not as strong as we think it is and that data suggests that so when you start putting these pieces together you start getting a very different picture I'm just going to give you one thing to watch to see how this goes this is where they made their announcement this is the dollar versus the yen watch how we act up here if you start to see this rolling. This is how you could actually look at everything we just went over. If you start to see us get to this level, which we are at right now, and we start to drop, that would be a sign. That would be a really clear indication that what we just discussed is coming to fruition. But this is what created fear in the market. And there's a lot of fear in the market still. And let's take a look at that. Now, there were two graphs oscillators that I thought were really interesting. First was fear and greed. We're going to go through this. Obviously, fear and greed model. This is actually based on CNN's model. And we're just going to walk through this again. It's really important to me that people actually understand what they're looking at. So this tells you the annualized return when you're at certain areas. Obviously, you can see below extreme. You're there 15% of the time, and it usually leads to a 23% return within a year. 7%, 67% of the time, which is the average. When you're above extreme and you're buying that greed for a very long period of time, you don't do very well. So this is the area that we're currently in now, but there's some other things that are developing with this that I think are really important. But I think we should just go through it. This model is based on the one published on CNN by their public website. We suggest you visit their site to learn more about the model. This is our calculation of the model based off the inputs discussed on their website. It does not reflect the values published by CNN. Rather, it's our interpretation of the model. It's really important because I will get comments from people and they will state, well, this isn't what CNN is saying. This is their interpretation of the data and the correct way to read it. So they've taken this and they've made it their own. And I think there's a very important distinction there. We use different inputs for the put call ratio, more accurately reflecting trading activity and a different junk bond input to avoid some issues with using an ETF based value. The model measures inputs such as price trend, volatility, option trading, bond trading to determine the prevailing investor sediment. So you can see what they're doing here and how it's a little different than what CNN's doing. Now, if we look at a five-year time fear period of the fear and greed model, which they've taken and they've made their own, everybody knows that I'm really big. Hopefully, if you're new to this, you don't know this, but I'm really big on understanding how these are calculated. Once you understand how you calculate it, you understand what they actually represent. That goes for every in indicator and oscillator that you use. You shouldn't take them at face value. You should actually look at what are they calculating. And you actually can learn a lot from it and then you can make it your own find different ways to utilize them see where you're at right here we can all see that this is definitely an area of just sheer fear if you come over and just look at this from here over you're not really here that much now to get to that zero line you have to have a lot of fear i.e you need a pandemic to get there but if we look at the most simplistic of things and just say what happens when we get over versus what happens when we get under. So in other words, you really want to look at that dot plot from when you first get over to really here and start getting a sense of that and seeing if there's something to that. And I think there's a really simple way to, to do that. And you know, what I would do is just take a look at this and just go, okay, well, if we look here and we said, okay, well, this is where we got all the way to that kind of peak level, tested peak level. Um, now you know that you kind of have that little divergence there. If you just put that there, there we go, mark that off. And then you come down to this level and you mark that off. And then what you would do is just say, okay, well, if I bought here, how would I do? And it kind of gives you a sense of where you're at. Same thing, if you just marked here, takes you up, takes you down to here, and you just go, okay, well, how would I do? And then you could go out and say, oh, how would this do over a month? How would this do over a year, et cetera, et cetera. The prevailing trend of what you're looking for is you must be over 
And this is obviously going to be a huge one. We're not going to use it. We really shouldn't use anything for this period of time because we really don't have anything like that. Actually, let's use from here over. I mean, obviously, we know that this was just completely manipulated with the amount of money that came in the market. So if you come to this level where they finally stop manipulating the market with free cash and you just take a look at this and you kind of come to that level and go, OK, well, that one really kind of gave us a little bit of a bump, but really wasn't a lot that we could do with it. Let's change the color of that. And then you start watching them here and going, OK, well, here's a little bit of a peak. And then you kind of go, OK, well, this is where we came in at. How'd that one go? That one went OK. We're over, but we didn't undercut. But you over and you're undercutting here. How's that going to go? And that puts you in a very different position. That's really ugly to look at. So I would suggest that you consider where we're at now. And then what would you do with that information? Well, I think it's pretty realistic that if you get down to this level, which is extremely rare, that annually over the 12 months, you have a fairly decent return. Now, what they do here is they've already taken the, the liberty of calculating it for you, where they're showing you if you're above the extreme over that period of time and you annualize it out once you're over, you're over 18% of the time, the annualized return there, meaning going out 12 months, if you analyze all that, you're going to get zero return, which means that it's probably a negative return and they're just zeroing it out. In between, you're, you're getting the average of seven. If you're below the extreme and you buy during that period of time, 12 months out, you're making 23% annualized on 15% of the market. Now, that's somewhat interesting because you could actually go here and take a look at this and go, okay, well, if I bought here 12 months out, how did we do? Well, I mean, it's really hard to say, but if we looked at that 12-month period that we're just looking at right now, you'd say you're still up considering you start looking here and obviously from here over from when it broke, if you went out 12 months, you're up. So if you start looking at it from that perspective, you could see how it would work. You hit here and then you just kind of keep walking through it over and over again. And you could see once again, you'd be up. All I'm doing is taking this low and then going out 12 months after you hit a high low. And then you would go here and just say that's roughly around. It would take you to about beginning of here. And in that one, you're clearly down, right? That's not going to work. Okay. Then we come to this one and we look at that mark and they are marking highs. I mean, I think that's a pretty, I think more than anything that that's something we should take away from as well. But if you look at the, after we hit the high and then hit the low, like we do here, and this takes you to roughly that September, October area where we put the bottom in. And if we were to mark that off and come out 12 months, well, you can see where we're at. and We've done quite nicely. And I would focus more on what's transpired since the Fed stopped injecting capital into the market since the pandemic. I take this out and I'd focus more on what happened here. And from this point on what happened here. And they weren't all perfect, obviously, because we were in the massive downward trend there as we worked off excess liquidity. But this is where we're at now. And this is what we have to focus on. I think it's very difficult to look at this and not say that based upon something like this, that 12 months from now, we probably are higher than we are right now. Sentiment Trader did a study. We're going to get to it in a moment here. But this is the S&P high beta, S&P high quality relative ratio rank. S&P is in black, S&P high beta, S&P high quality ratio rank and they assign a level to it here it is an 11 you can see that we've been zeroed and what we're really going to focus on is the zero lines and what happens there after you've been at a certain level now before we do that let's drill into this this chart shows where the ratio is relative to its range over the past four months when the ratio is high investors are showing risk on when the ratio drops to a low level they are exhibiting risk off high risk on low risk off now, before we dig into their study and we look at these little areas that are in here, you can see how little time you've actually spent with this amount of risk off. Matter of fact, if we're going to mark those times here and just take a look at them, it's not a lot. Now, if I mark those zero lines, I'm only going to mark for three years. The study that I'm going to show you goes out the entirety of what they have, which is about 12, 15 years. But if you look at these little dots right here, it gets pretty clear that when you have this much risk off, you're putting in some kind of bottom. Now, I want to be clear about this. It doesn't mean that we're going to go up and take out all-time highs. What I'm simply suggesting is over three years, when you have this much risk off, it doesn't really seem like it's the worst place to buy. A matter of fact, there's really only one other time when you were in a downtrend, a major downtrend, that you bought here and would have been down. But let's take a look at this study and what it's telling us. So to be clear again, this is not my study. This is from Sediment Trader. I did talk to them ahead of time to make sure that it's okay that I show this material. And I think it's really pertinent. It's a great service. I have nothing to do with it, but they crush data and they've got great, they've got great indicators and I'm not affiliated with them. There's no affiliate link or anything like that. It's just a really good service. So I'm just very simply pointing it out. They crunch stuff that makes me not have to crunch stuff, if that makes sense. So we know where we're at. We know we have all. I just showed you 
three years. So looking at the way that they're, they're calculating it and what they're showing is they're showing a five period moving average. I was showing something different, but they're crunching this to a five period moving average. I'm showing what happens on the risk line down here. They're showing it through a five period. So the period might have it shift over and have it a little bit different. I think it's gonna have, this is gonna be way more nuanced, quite frankly, and harder to get to that zero line as you can even see down here from some of the other marks I had before. Look where you are now, and that's an important distinction. So you can see how these marks are. That's the pandemic, very hard to utilize that for obvious reasons. This is not so hard and it didn't go ideal there. But if you take a look here as well, you see these levels down here and you can see how we've acted from there. What's important to me is where are we in a year? But what they do is they take all these data points and they crush the numbers. Now I want to say something. I'm a big numbers junkie as anyone knows that watches this. They're crunching numbers. For anything to have true statistical significance, you need 30. We don't have 30. So we either can use what we have or we're not going to use anything. So someone that is a statistician may look at this and say it's not statistically significant because blah, blah, blah. They're right. This is the hand we're dealt. This is what we're gonna deal with. So we have a base from going back to about 12. So here we are, 2012. Now, average returns, median returns, win rate. So we're gonna look at the average returns, the median returns, and the win rate. And I think this is really important. If you go out two weeks later, on average, from where you are around two weeks later, the average return is negative 3.14%, and there is a 42% chance that this is where you're at. One month later, you're down 80 basis points. Now, what's interesting about that is if you're down 3% and then you're here at 80%, we are actually going up from there, 42% win rate. Hopefully you follow that. But what gets interesting is what happens later. Two months later, you're up. There's a coin toss that you're up. Three months later, which takes us towards the end of the year, there's a 58% chance you're up 4.5% from here. Six months later, 8.5%, 8.8% rather, 92% chance of that. One year later, 17%, there's a 100% chance of that. And again, this is all we have, so this is what we're going to work with. But I did find this interesting. I would suggest that you almost have to take out, again, this pandemic level. Uh, and that actually is pretty much throwing it off too. But this is just such an anomaly. It's so hard to utilize. People will say we should leave it in there anyway in case we have another anomaly. There's something to that as well. But I do think that this was pretty fascinating. And I do think that it, it alludes to what's going on there with fear and uncertainty as we just were talking about what was happening in Japan. And now when we, if we look at this and we understand that risk is off, fear and they're taking risk off. Tie those together with what's happening in Japan, where we are in the indexes, and then it might make a little more sense on what has recently been happening with stocks. You're setting up here, and you're really setting up a cup and handle. It's an ugly one, but it's there. The other thing that I find interesting is we have a problem with the 55 on Tesla, and then we push through it, and then we're above it more than five days. Then we break, and when we break, we're not really taking out the new lows. And I, There's an important distinction here. I'm just going to go through this before I, I draw the cup and handle that's probably going to ire a lot of people, and they're going to comment below. But if you look at your breakout bar, which is right there, right? So we know that this is a control bar. Marabuzu White, that's the pattern right here. It's a pretty powerful pattern. Essentially, it's just a bar uh, going in one direction that has no candles whatsoever or no wicks associated with it. I should say it that way. Apologies. So you're breaking out. You go sideways. You never break it. Retests that breakout. That buyer is still there. No matter what we want to say, no matter how we want to look at the world, no matter what I think of, of what's happening in the auto industry, or that held. And so I, I need to pay attention to that. Now, there's a couple other really interesting things going on with Tesla, and I'm gonna spend a little time there, but, and I'm not saying it's gonna just automatically run up, but I'm saying this is developing. So maybe this long bias is not the worst idea, but also we could just look at it, you can kind of see it right there, drawing it kind of wonky, but it's sitting right in there. And maybe the thing to do is just watch this doji, watch this undercut, because if you break through that, that 238, that's pretty much it. We really didn't break down. And what I tend to find is if we keep hitting something, eventually it opens. You know, I have the saying, if you keep knocking on a door long enough, eventually it's going to open. You just might not like what you get. But if you take a look at this, there's, there's, there's something there. And the fact that we've been hitting these lower lows uh, forever, and then we've stopped. I don't know if maybe you have noticed that, but from 23 on, we're just not doing that. So we have this really powerful DTL up here, downward trend line. And if we look at that, you're going to say, well, it's not going to break. It might not. It might. And let's be realistic about this. This may never break. Right. That is that is a possibility. You could just roll right back over. My cup and handle could be smashed. Uh, you know, the company's valuation, we can make all kinds of arguments. And I'm not here to do that today. We'd be a whole video in an hour on Tesla. Let's look at this and say, okay, 
well, we've tried three times, four times, five times. You knock on a door long enough, eventually it's gonna open. I think there's something here. Now, if you want to think if this downtrend is gonna continue, and I'm gonna spend some time here because I think this is really significant, you, you have to get through this level. I think it's 212 is the real level that's dropped it down to there. So that's really where this is completely and utterly busted. And you can really come across that level and see how you've been playing with it forever. So you held the support from back in 22 and you held it here again after you flipped it. And that's after it became what? Resistance, resistance, resistance. You can see this bonk, 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 right? And so now what you're trying to get through, I, there's something here and I would keep this on your radar. One other really interesting detail here is that this is the Ichimoku cloud. Look what happens, we came into it, out again, touched it, and we held right on that level. I just find it interesting. I think it was just worth noting. MEP is a name that we shorted in the room and did quite well with. Uh, obviously, when this cracked this day, there was some news that came out about the dividend. Uh, if you're trying to bottom fish this, I would strongly sp suggest that you spend some time actually reading the, the actual news that came out about the company and that came out about the partnership associated with the company. It's a little different than people think it is. I'm not gonna get into it all right now, but it's not that they just cut the dividend, they cut the growth that will now be associated with the dividend as well. So it's, it's a lot more complex than that, in my opinion. And I think people are missing that. Uh, this can still go down. This can still go down. This is still a, a pretty significant short position for me. Uh, we've done quite well with it. Usually with names like this, what I will do is I'll buy out of the money puts with some of the profits, which I've already done. Uh, and then if the position's long or big enough, which this one is, I'll actually just marry out of the money calls to it because I've been, you know, we're up a, a decent chunk in it. The reason I'm pointing this one out is because when I was running scans this morning, I'm recording this at Saturday morning, but when I was running scans this morning, this BEP stood out. And then I started looking into it at BEPC, and you start digging into these, and really, this came down the same exact time as NEE. Now, NEE is what we have here in the US, and it appears, from my, from my standpoint, this thing's in a lot of trouble, a, a, a lot. Um, I don't see it, I'm just gonna be blunt. I don't know how you're not going back to pandemic lows. I don't know how this thing doesn't become a teenager. I mean, I hate, I hate to be that callous, but I, I just don't see it. And I hate saying that I don't know, trying to quote, predict things. It's not really my wheelhouse, but it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't think reality is set in for these people yet. It's just my opinion. So if you, if you look at this, this is the equivalent BEPC. This is the equivalent of the one that's in Europe. And we're starting to see cracks here. Now, I'm not ex exactly sure why this one would be cracking as well. Is the problems that NEE is having, are they gonna be the same kinds of problems that they have over there? I'm not entirely sure, but when you, when you look at this chart, this thing is, this is God awful. And you know, God awful is the actual technical term. But what, what I, I'm looking at is I've got nothing. There's nothing below here. You're, you're ready to go off a cliff. You know, you have blue skies above, you got deep water below. And like, there, there, there's nothing here that's going to stop this thing or give it any kind of footing whatsoever. So you start cracking here, uh, they're throwing in the towel. So this is something that you really want to pay attention to. You certainly want to watch. It'll definitely be on my radar. If you're not into shorting, then you, know, you obviously don't want to watch it for a, a litany of reasons. But we're seeing a lot of really weird things going on. And um, I think it, it makes sense to talk about the other side of the coin, the shorting side of the coin. And you guys can always comment on this stuff. I, this is even of interest, but I, I think it should be because even if you're not shorting, why should you care? Because you want to know what trends are going on so you don't step in front of a train. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're out there right now thinking that you want to buy uh, some kind of winery or some kind of spirit company, and you start seeing these names break down like Napa, you start drilling into these names. You wouldn't go near these names with a 10-foot pole right now if you start looking at them all. Uh, this is, looks like it's completely toast. I mean, this does not look like it's ever coming back candidly, like it's going to go to single digits and become a toddler. So I would definitely, if you're looking to, for ideas to short, it's really hard to look at this when something becomes so emphatic and say it, you're not interested in shorting it. When you finally make that break, you, you want to pay attention to it. So, And you're just seeing some really weird discrepancies out there that I just think are worth talking about. You know, Hershey's usually moves up when sugar moves up. And you can see right here where I have sugar. And you see how sugar's going and you can see how Hershey's going. And that makes sense because who else is gonna have a huge inventory of sugar but, but a chocolate company. But we're getting this really weird divergence now. And the question to me is why? Why are we getting this divergence? And I'm gonna just be blunt, I, I don't know, but there, there is something significantly wrong. If we go through May and we realize that from May on, we have had one week where you've had a higher high close where you're actually over above the previous bar, not an inside close like this, but an actual higher high like, hey, no, no, we have support, we have buyers. Uh, we have no buyers here. 
And I'm not really sure why. You have these natural gas delivery companies and they're all breaking down. And they're not just breaking down a little. These are these are multi-year breakdown. You have Sprouts Farmers Market. You know, energy drives the world. Other names, I would really start looking at some of these software names on balances. And uh, you know, I'm going to for sure, I'll just put it that way. Um, it's not a perfect cup and handle by any stretch. But look how many times we're hitting this 532, 62 level. They benefit significantly from AI. And AI is not going away, despite what you're going to hear. But you know, you're going to go through innings and waves. And we've discussed that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bore everybody with that again. But we can cover it in greater detail if you want to. But I focus on what we're seeing happen. And we're starting to see some of these names hold a little bit, aren't we? And we're seeing these weird upgrades. And then you're looking at these names like Snow and people, you know, I'm looking at this going, oh, it's this huge bear pendant. Is it, or am I, am I building some kind of base here, getting ready to break out of it in a higher high, and then I have a failed pendant? I, well, I'm not going to know to 190, so I'm not going to wait for that. But what I might want to do is start looking at when I'm hitting these lower trend lines now, because we are in a trading range. You need to just start developing and taking what the market will give you, and stop telling the market what it's going to do. And I'm, this is where you've been since June. You haven't been going anywhere. If you haven't been trading, and you haven't been short-term trading on any level, you're not making money. So you have to take what the market's going to give you. The idea that you're just going to buy and hold when the market does that, it's just, it's not going to work. It's going to drive you absolutely nuts. We should talk about NVIDIA as well and what's going on here. Uh, you're starting to see a shift. So, and what do I mean by that? One, two, three, three weeks down. Now we start turning the higher high. I would have liked the undercut, candidly. I didn't get the undercut. That would have been better for me. Uh, the lower low, and then they flush, and then we go. So that's not what I got. I have to take what I got, and that's what it is. Uh, what I will say is it's still fairly interesting. Look at this on a daily and drill into it, and, and it's pretty interesting. Again, you're finding these support levels, and you're holding them, right? Now, people will look at that. I see it, and if I don't use that peak, and you come here, you have another one right there, and you can see. And this one, to me, is more important. I'll explain why. Because you held this test, couldn't get through, couldn't get through Doji City in here, and you can see that pretty easily, right? And what do we do? We flip. We had every intention to sell down. There every reason that we could have sold down the other day. And you start going through these names like Meta. That is a nasty reversal that happened on Friday. Absolutely nasty. This thing looked like it was going to be an absolute beast on Friday. And then out of nowhere, it just broke VWAP. And watch this. That's why I always tell people, like, if you're struggling, start, go, start extending your time frame if you're a short-term trader to five minutes and just drop VWAP in. If you broke VWAP on, you, on the other side of a trade on a five minute right now, very simply, you're on the wrong side of the trade. So you, you look at that, unless you're going to try to play like the, you know, the gap fill. But I mean, that didn't, that certainly didn't work. But you're starting to see some of this kind of stuff. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, what that was all about, the gap up and then all of a sudden down 10. Uh, you can say that that is due to what's going on in the world, but oh, it's, it's the government shutdown. Okay, well, it didn't happen here. I mean, granted, we didn't close up, but it certainly didn't happen here on Apple. You start going through some of these other names. Uh, it really didn't happen on Microsoft. Sure, we came down, but we didn't really come down to the same level of magnitude. So there's something there. I do. I am starting to get the sense that we, we are getting a little washed down on some of these names. Let me just drop this in real quick. Uh, you know, I use a lot of different systems to determine whether or not we're getting exhausted. This is giving a bunch of exhausted readings. You know, the easiest thing to do at some times like this is just kind of drop some of these lines in and see where you're sitting. It's real easy to kind of see that you know, if you're dropping down and all of a sudden the RSI starts curling up, which you're doing right now, you start flipping levels, you haven't flipped for months like the 12. There's signs here, there's, there's clear signs. I'm not gonna go into everything that I use to determine this. Um, I could do a whole darn video just on that. But I think that this is pretty significant, and I definitely think it's something that we should be paying attention to. I do see some shifts out there that are worth noting. And uh, I, I also would just point this out with energy and leave you with this, at least leave you with this thought. You know, we're not able to take out that higher high. And if we just clean up the chart and we look here on the energy side, ever since you broke down there, you're just not able to get over. So what that means, I'm not really sure. There's some coal names out there that look absolutely amazing, but I'm just not really sure that that's the way that we should be uh, we should be looking. And you know, some of these other names just we need to pay attention to. I thought this was worth noting. Gold relative to the 20 year. And you can see how we've just been on an absolute tear if you were long gold and short treasuries. You're getting to that level of the great financial crisis. So if we're not in a great financial crisis, 
we're certainly trading like one. So what does that mean? Eventually, I keep saying this, but it's not happening. Eventually, TLT is going to rally. Now, this is a monthly chart. And that's the beauty of doing this uh, when, at the end of the month. Does that look like it's going to hold? Uh, not really, no, but it's worth noting. Also, I would just throw this out on Newmont. Does that look like it's going to hold? Uh, not really, no. So it, it, to me, it's almost a race to to who's gonna drop less. And I just think it's an important distinction to note. But overall, these names on Friday, you know, they, we did hold, we didn't actually completely and utterly break down. Now, if you look at this on a monthly chart with Apple, awful, it's not ideal either. To me, it looks like there's another month there that you could see some pain. You start looking at some of these guys like Microsoft, yeah, you're forming that double top up here, aren't you? And you have another wick up here. So you start looking at some of these monthly charts and I'm, I'm doing this on purpose. I would suggest that you start looking at the world this way, not because you're going to trade off of it, but it just really gives you a much different picture when you start looking at this stuff and saying, you know, are these things breaking out? Are they not breaking out? Another thing that was worth noting here with names like Dell, uh, these kinds of names like Hewlett Packard, like SMCI, this is the number one group on the year as far as performance. That's all corporations, a huge bear flag on the weekly, isn't it? So this, this is what corporations are buying. So if corporations are buying the Dells, they're buying these names, you know, we still have something going on out there where CapEx is increasing, meaning they are spending money to buy equipment. And I think that that is still another you know, data point that we kind of have to wrap our, our noodle around. That's it.